so welcome again. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Shonda Harris, and I'm a business opportunity specialist with the Columbus Small Business Administration, the SBA. And we'd like to welcome you today, Wednesday, August 4th, um, to today's webinar on Hub Zone Manufacturing Training with DLA and SBA. We are really excited that we are able to partner with PTACs, Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, um, and then partner up with DLA Land and Maritime to bring you today's webinar. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can see today's agenda. And just to let you know, today's webinar is being recorded. So um, if you need to go back, some of the information, I'm sure you'll get tons of information today. And if you'd like to go back and have this as a resource, you can do so. Um, so again, this is the welcome for today. And it's part of the welcome. Um, one of the things we love doing as we bring on so many webinars and we do so many webinars, actually, today's webinar is a part of the government contracting series that we partner with the PTATS, Procurement Technical Assistance Centers to put on to train small businesses as it relates to them doing business with the government. So we highlight a variety of topics and I don't believe we've done anything on manufacturing um, and with the hub zone program recently. So we are always excited to do so. And today's webinar is a series. We will be doing another webinar in a couple of weeks um, and having a panel discussion. Um, so again, today's session is a part of uh, the government contracting series that we do with PTAX. So if you're a small business, if you're in a hub zone, if you have your hub zone certification, you may be learning a lot of information today. You may be at a different stage, a different process um, as it relates to you doing government contracting. Perhaps you're doing business with DLA, that is wonderful, or you desire to do business with DLA. Well, you are in the right place. So. Um, without further ado, we want to um, allow you to have an overview of PTAC, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, so that you know of the different services that they provide and they offer. Um, because if you're a small business and you're just getting started in your government contracting journey, the PTACs um, can assist you with um, practically every stage um, as it relates to you doing business with the government. So Mr. Bill Cox, who's the Associate Director of the Dayton PTAC, is going to share a little bit more about PTAC with you. Bill? Thank you, Shonda. And we'll uh, uh, oh, wait me to stop. get my slides up. Yeah, you have to stop sharing your go. screen. There you go. And Sharon, if you'll bring my slides up, please. Uh, thank you. I only have about seven slides, folks, so this is going to go quick. And this was the first one. Next slide, please. <laughs> Oops. PTAC is a nationwide organization. And our mission is to work with businesses who we refer to as our clients to train and advise them in how to pursue and execute government contracts or subcontracts at the federal, state, and local government level. We do not do uh, provide any support on grants and we don't do B2B. We do this through having appointments with our clients where we'll provide guidance, advice, we'll answer questions. And of course, during the pandemic, and now kind of in the uh, what might be called the post-pandemic era, we're doing most of these, if not all these meetings, uh, using uh, virtual, virtual meetings. We will participate and sponsor group training seminars like the one we're doing today. We also have what's called a bid matching service where we will establish a profile for your business, typically either uh, your North American Industrial Classification System codes, 
and perhaps either some product service codes or federal supply codes. Or we can use keywords and phrases to establish a profile for your business. Then our system goes out and searches a number of procurement websites that government use and then selects items that match your profile. You will then be sent an email with about almost once a day with links to things that match your profile. And then you can click on the link and it will take you to the source system and you can read about whatever was posted by the government. We also have a couple of different market intelligence tools that we can do research on behalf of our clients. For example, one, some research I'm doing right now for a new client um, who's new to the uh, government procurement is if I want to partner with uh, other companies and be a subcontractor to them, who is winning the contracts within my NAICS code? This is just an example of the type of research that we do. The good news is PTAC services are free to our clients. Now, I will admit sometimes we will partner with organizations that will have training events that may charge a fee to defray the expenses of the event. Of the event. An example is facility rental. But uh, generally, these are very nominal and we try to uh, keep these to a minimum. Next slide, please, Sharon. As I mentioned, we will support businesses pursuing federal, state, and local government procurement. For federal uh, contracting, we will assist businesses with uh, registering in the system for award management, which uh, many of you know, know have uh, the system has undergone major changes recently and still continues to evolve from those major changes. And it seems like they are uh, issuing system updates periodically to uh, uh, correct, correct uh, bugs and things that they found. We will also assist businesses in doing their applications for socioeconomic certifications, which are very important in federal procurement. Uh, the Hub Zone, the Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business, the Woman Owned Small Business, and the Disadvantaged uh, Minority Program known as the 8A Program. One of the important things that we stress to a, a new client uh, wanting to pursue government procurement is to have what we call a capability statement. And you can think that as a one page resume of your business. And we will uh, advise and review cap businesses and review their capability statements and give them suggestions. Uh, because too many we find are kind of written in what I call a war and peace format. And typically a contracting officer may only have time to spend 45 seconds or a minute on a capability statement. So it needs to be written in concise, bulletized language where a contracting officer can quickly scan it and get an impression and walk away from reading that statement and say, okay, I understand what this business does and what line of work they're in. We'll also talk to clients about how to identify and pursue opportunities. Uh, the bid matching is an important part of that. How to approach a procurement official. What does that procurement official want to know about your company when they meet you? What are they looking for? We help advise you and train you on how to have those kind of meetings. And then how to respond to a government solicitation and government information requests. Because government solicitations require specific uh, uh, responses from government for a proposal, and we will go through the solicitation uh, with you and tell you here's how you need to respond and what the government wants to know. We've also uh, had training seminars in the past about how to do this, and those have been very, very popular events. We'll talk to you about strategy and about teaming and any other topics that you would like to bring to our attention. 
Next slide, please. Now, every state will have a similar uh, charter organization. Uh, we're no different in the state of Ohio. Our program, the PTAC program nationwide, is sponsored and funded by the Defense Logistics Agency. Now, that's going to change on 1 October, but for now, it's the Defense Logistics Agency. Within the state of Ohio, there are two major organizations involved. There is what's called the Southern Ohio PTAC, and they go direct to the Defense Logistics Agency for their grant to, uh, to provide their services in a handful of counties down in Southern Ohio. And then there's the state of Ohio, Ohio network, as we call it, and the state actually goes to the Defense Logistics Agency and submits a proposal and receives a grant. Within the state of Ohio network, there are three sub-grantees. Road State College in Lima, Ohio, uh, handles the northwest corner of the state. Youngstown State, over on the eastern side of, the, of Ohio, uh, handles the city of Youngstown and I believe three counties that uh, are in that area. And then the bulk of the state is, is handled by Ohio University. And we have procurement uh, counselors in these major cities. And like I said, every state will have a similar type organization. The funding for our PTACs, uh, for the Ohio University PTAC, comes from three sources in descending order of contribution. The bulk of the funding comes through the state from the Defense Logistics Agency. Then as a sub-grantee, Ohio University is required to put up resources, either, either uh, money or uh, facilities or services in kind. And then we also get funding from the state of Ohio. So therefore we're not affiliated with any business or for-profit enterprise. So we are independent and free of bias. So whenever we talk to a client and give you advice, there are no strings attached. Next slide. Now, if you'd like to obtain PTAC services, and we realize a lot of the uh, people registered for this event today are from outside Ohio, we have a national association, and there is the URL for the website. Select the state where your business physically resides, and then it will bring up a list of the PTAC offices in your state, and then contact the office closest to your business. If your business is physically located in Ohio, uh, this is the website that we have. Uh, you can select the new client registration tab, fill in the online application and submit it online. And then we will contact you and schedule an appointment and develop up and develop a follow-up plan uh, for a plan of action to assist you and we will support you to the level you desire. But let me make it clear, we cannot represent your company to the government. That is your job. Next slide, please. So very quickly, I will tell you that government procurement is, is a tough business. There is a strong competition for every solicitation. If you don't understand the process and procedures, you are at a very severe disadvantage. So it is important that you understand government procurement before you dip your toe into this water and your local PTAC office stands ready to assist you. So thank you very much for your attention and Shonda, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Bill. And so if you're on here today, if you're joining from another state or if you're here in Ohio, please utilize your PTAX um, as you can, as Bill so adequately presented, they offer such a broad scope of services. And as he stated, I wanna echo that government contracting can be tough and especially at the federal level can be very daunting, challenging and overwhelming 
but the PTACs are there to offer you assistance. So please utilize them at any stage um, of your government contracting journey from beginning to end. Um, with that said, our next, um, we will actually have, um, will we begin our presentations um, with the DLA evaluation process, the do's and don'ts. We actually have Alonzo Burris II, who was a contracting officer with DLA Land and Maritime here in Columbus. And he's been with the agency for six years as a contracting officer. So he's gonna actually share um, kind of his perspective of what the contracting officers do look for and then give you some suggestions and advice as small business owners. And I would encourage you, if you do have a question, if you can go ahead and put those in the chat and we will try to address those as Alonzo is presenting. And then also we're gonna ask if you are not presenting, if you would turn your cameras off. Um, I do notice one person um, that does have on their camera, Stephen Pate, if you could turn off your camera for us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you're not presenting, if you can, thank you so much. It just makes it a little easier. All right. And uh, yes, we will be sending out the link to, the, to today's recording so that you can have that. Thank you. And um, we'll go from there. Thank you, Alonzo. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, there we go. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Alonzo Burris, contracting officer with DLA Land and Maritime Land Supplier Operations. And what I wanted to do is make sure you understand some of the evaluation factors that, that we run up against. Next slide, please. Okay, so when we do, when we send out a solicitation, the one thing that comes out is the master solicitation. And if you, if, if I read this, it says evaluation factors for award. And the award will be made to offers whose quotes or offers conforms to the solicitation requirements and represents the best value to the government. And I wanna focus on the best value because whenever a solicitation comes in, and we're looking at your quotes, you're looking at your offers. Uh, we have to evaluate it based off of past performance, the offer delivery and the price when we uh, do the evaluation. And each one of these carries the exact same weight. So <clears throat> what I wanna point out and the reason why I'm saying this is because it would be the same as if you were going out to buy a car and you're looking at, let's just use Honda, you, and you're comparing Honda to Acura. Well, you don't necessarily have to discount your Honda Accord to the price of a Civic in order for us to uh, choose you. We're looking at the best value, okay? So <clears throat> the award may be made to other than a lowest price, technically acceptable, responsible offer. And this is very important um, because when we do this, when we're looking at it and we're evaluating, uh, when we're looking at past performance, well, the past performance is everything that you do after the award, uh, whether it's going, you know, putting in modifications and things with uh, our post-award side of the house. Once they tell the pre-award, which I'm pre-award, uh, once they tell us that they're having issues with a manufacturer or a or a uh, contractor on that side of the house, then that's something that we have to take into account when we're doing the award, because we want to make sure our whole process is to get this item to the warfighter as fast and without complications. So past performance is really good. It's it's something that will it can make or break uh, the award. The offer delivery, um, we always want it as fast. Our thing is when we're asking for it, for the most part, we want it 
yesterday um, when we <laughs> when we solicit it tomorrow is basically the way it's been. And then the price will be evaluated as well. So we're looking at all three and it doesn't necessarily have to be the lowest, but it needs to be the best value when it comes to that. Next slide, please. Okay, so you have limitations and prohibitions on the use of the lowest price technically acceptable source selection process. Now, the reason why I put this up here is because I wanna make sure that you understand that we have an automated system. So if you do um, discount your pricing and it's not picked up by the automated system, then it drops and it comes to my desk or it comes to a contracting officer's desk and then you go into the best value. Uh, so as soon as it becomes manual, the lowest price technically acceptable, acceptable uh, portion of the process is gone. Um, so what we've noticed is that, or what I've noticed is that whenever there's a protest, uh, it's typically because a contractor is saying that they offered a lower price than someone else, but you just have to realize that we're looking at the best value at that point. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then you have hub zones and parity, uh, which is the relationship among small business programs. And what we, what I wanted to make sure that you understand on this is that there's no order of precedence uh, among the programs. It kind of just depends on how the solicitation was was written. So if it's a hub zone set aside, then we're going to look at hub zones first uh, because they were. Um, specifically set aside for the hub zone program. Uh, if it's service disabled, uh, same thing, we're gonna look at service disabled first. Uh, 8A, we're gonna look at 8A first. So <clears throat> when, when you're looking at this or you're looking at a solicitation, it's very important that you're paying attention to how it was solicited. Uh, make sure that you have all the boxes checked um, there's been times where, where the solicitation is saying that it's a hub zone, but yet it will come in, your quote will come in as a small business, not as a hub zone. And then once we go looking into the quote, we see that you have it as a secondary, secondary thing where you're listed as a hub zone as well. So if you have one of these uh, social economic programs, I would encourage you to list it as the first, as the main, because when it comes through the system, it's going to pick up that main one and it will knock you down to the bottom. Um, so the small business set asides have priority over acquisitions using full and open competition. Next slide, please. Okay, it looks like there was a question. I'll answer most of the questions at the end. I'll go back into the chat. Um, below SAT, at or below the uh, simplified acquisition threshold, uh, the requirement to exclusively reserve acquisitions for small business concerns does not preclude the contracting officer from awarding a contract to a hub zone business or another socioeconomic program. Okay, and that's below SAT. And then above set, uh, the contracting officer, basically there's a, on our 2579s when we're um, making the award or making the uh, solicitation, we have to look at the hub zone program uh, if it's above set. We have to actually look at it and consider it prior to making the award. So this also puts another spotlight on the small business program so that we can actually award to them because we recognize that the uh, hub zones are, you know, they, they pretty much run the country. They're, they're gonna help um, boost the economy. Next slide, please.
Now, this is a big, a big deal. Uh, back in November 2020, they changed the cybersecurity requirements. And what we're noticing is that a lot of small businesses, I'm not sure what happened, but a lot of them don't know about these programs. <clears throat> and so were these changes to the FAR and to the DFARS. So you have this rule now, and if you don't have these, uh, these things in place, then it just automatically disqualifies you from the award. So you wanna make sure that you have these requirements in place. And these requirements are DFARS 252.204-7019, 7020, and 7021. And I'll just read this rule. The Department of Defense has issued an interim rule, uh, 2019 DO41, related to the cybersecurity requirements in DFARS 252.204.712. The purpose of this new rule is to access the cybersecurity protections each individual contractor has in place and includes two main requirements. The first requirement is to implement a DOD uh, NIST SP 800-171 assessment methodology. The second requirement is to access the contractor's implementation of cybersecurity protections via the cybersecurity maturity uh, model certification, CMMC. Next slide, please. Okay, because I know I just threw that on you and you probably had no idea what that was, um, but I wanted to give you the cybersecurity requirements and the contractor information and resources, which explains all that. I also um, sent out a, a um, PDF of, to answer questions concerning this that Shonda or Sharon, I'm sure can get out to you. Um, but basically, this is this is all the information that's needed to make sure that you have all of this uh, in the system. Because the only thing we do is we go to Spurs and we're looking for we're looking to see if you have that assessment. If you do not have that assessment, then we automatically disqualify you for from the award. And this is something that could be huge because we could be all the way into the evaluation process thinking that we're going to give you the award and then this cybersecurity requirement will knock you out of the way and it's just that simple because we're <laughs> and it has to be done at time of award so it's not something that we can say uh give you time to go get done it has to be done at the time of award so i would rec highly recommend you to uh and encourage you to get this done um, so that you don't miss out. Next slide, please. Okay. And let me see what questions. Alonzo, do you want me to pose the questions to you? Would that be easier yeah. so you don't have to go back? Yeah, that'd, I think, that'd be easy. Okay. I think this one, Donna can answer as far as the, um, uh, well, let's start with the one on, you mentioned past performance. Yes. And how would this affect a new contractor? Okay. So new contractors, we give you a shot. Um, we don't hold that against you at all. Uh, you're coming in with a clean slate. So in essence, if you, if you don't have a past performance, we just look at it like, okay, as long as we can basically tell that you are not just a, um, that you're actually a real business. Um, I think the only time that really comes into play is if it's, like we've run into occasions where a person is running a business out of their garage mm. <laughs> or in a condo in South Beach. And then they're saying that they're ISO, you know, they, they have the okay. high level, <laughs> higher level <laughs> um, um, 
certifications and things like that. And we're like, well, they can't make it there. They don't even look like a manufacturer or anything like that. So that's, um, so if we don't hold it against you. It's just, we give you a clean slate, give you a shot. And in a lot of cases, um, you just, you have to just perform at that point. You have to perform. Now with some instances, just to clarify, with that past performance, because some people may be relatively new in business a year or two, they mm -hmm. may not have experience with the federal government, but maybe they've done business with the state or local or county government or the private sector or commercial, but that's still yeah. past performance. You're not necessarily looking for, um, you know, for them to have done business with the agency. Is that, is that correct? With that's an cool. agency. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and then we have ways of looking as well uh, to go cross agency or uh, find out if they can, if they've made stuff um, for commercial uh, entities as well. So we're, I mean, in a lot of instances, Google has been our friend. Because <laughs> we'll Google, we'll do everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to try to get that award to that to that contractor. Okay, awesome. And then do you use the SBA dynamic small business search? Yes, we the do. The SBS, that's a great resource. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I believe this next question is more so for Donna, but I'll mention it if you have something to add. This person has trouble downloading technical files such as drawings. For DLA opportunities, the list, the links just take them in circles on dibs and they can't obtain the technical files. Do you want Donna to Hello? answer? Can you answer? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hello there. I'm Donna Brito Blackwell. Uh, we run into that quite a bit. This is nothing foreign. What we, she needs to do, or he needs to do, is to send, can you send me an email and we can take you, give you the information that you need to have to get that straightened out for you. But we run into that quite a bit. Okay, Donna, can you thank you okay. so much for chiming in? Can you type in your email in the chat, or somebody can type in Donna's email in the chat so that gentleman can have that? Because my chat is not okay. working right. Okay. Okay, that's okay, Jill. Or okay. Jill, can you type in Donna's email in the chat for? Got it. Will do. Thank you. All thank right. You, now, next question. No Teamwork always makes the dream work. Um, is there any order of precedence among the small business programs? Why do contracting officers prefer to sole source to 8A rather than hub zone or any other designation? Well, that kind of depends on, I probably should let Donna answer that one. Because and I can chime uh, in a little bit. I can chime in a little bit too, because I work with 8A companies, so. Yeah. Yeah, because when it comes to 8A, they're a different animal for us. Um, right. I know that they already have, like, uh, most of them are direct. Right. And we just, we just pretty much contact the small business office, and then they tell us who to award to when it comes to those. So Donna would have, or you would have more info on that as to why it's that way. Donna, if you want to chime yeah, in and add some extra. Yeah, I want to make sure I heard the question correctly. Though they said, I thought I heard what you read is that they felt as though more AAs were getting awards versus hub no, zones. And is that no, what mm -mm, that wasn't the question. Okay, what, is is what there is there an order of precedence among the small business programs with the set asides? Why do contracting there officers is. prefer to sole source to 8A? rather than hub zone or any other designation or certification. And they, and they and that person is, is correct. There is no order of presence that should not be. But in the right. past, there, you know, it's, how can I put this? It has been that way. Is it, it's been everyone else can get so forth but hub zones. In fact, we're in the middle of that discussion now as we talk, you know, with I'm looking closely with the agency directors, land and maritime to make sure we meet on a uh, monthly basis and we bring all of this to the, you know, bring any issues that we may have or concerns as it pertains to the hub zone program and why, and, and she's right. And why, and what's going on and what's wrong 
And we, we discussed that. That was one of the topics that we're going to discuss. And we're talking about that now of getting, trying to get more source sources, the source, those sources. What's going on, they also say is that they prefer competition. But I understand that. That's separate from sole source. So I'm willing to go to bat for any hub zone business that, as well as my deputy director, my director, we have a new director, Dynamic, uh, for any sole source hub zone that deserves an award and they, they're qualified for the award, we'll go to bat with you. We'll work, we'll work with you to see why that can not take place. There's more of that going on now. The past, yes. That has been a trend in the past, but we're trying to change those things now. Okay, thank you, Donna. And if, if I'll Welcome. add just a, a chime in and add a little bit to that, this is Shonda Harris. I'm a BOS, myself and Jill Nagy Reynolds, and we work directly with 8A companies. And so some of that is the way the 8A program is set up. Um, 8A companies can get direct awards. So that is one of the um, benefits of being an 8A company is that they can get sole source direct awards. And then also if a requirement is in the 8A program, then that is another way that a company is going to get an um, 8A contract, a sole source contract. So if a requirement is in the 8A program, it's gonna stay in the program. And sometimes it makes it easier for contracting officers to do direct awards depending on the amount of the uh, requirement, if it's 4.5 for non-manufacturers and 7.5, if it's underneath that threshold, then contracting officers can do direct awards to 8A companies for 8A awards. And so, um, no, there's no order of precedence, but the 8A program is just a little bit differently. So Shonda, there's that. just one thing I wanna add to that too. Go, go right ahead. Uh, this is Jill Nagy Reynolds. I'm with the SBA Columbus District Office. Uh, Shauna and I work uh, the 8A portfolio together. Uh, the, it's also statutory because yes. uh, within, within 13 CFR, uh, 8As can be awarded a sole source contract without justification on the mm -hmm. part of a contracting officer. And that's the only program that has that. So hub zone, woman owned and service disabled veteran owned also have sole source authority, but it's with justification. So that means the contracting officer has to put in writing why one hub zone that's equally technically capable is, is uh, better than another hub zone, which is really hard to do. So uh, it's easier to award through 8A because there's not that justification rule. Thank you. Um, if somebody can go back on a couple slides, someone was writing down a couple of the URLs. So if you can go back and, um, okay. And just as it relates to the cybersecurity information, um, very timely, we just did, um, last month, our focus with the PTAC, as far as our government contracting webinars, we had two sessions on cybersecurity training. So they were recorded. And if um, one of the PTAC counselors can put the link in the chat, there are two um, webinar sessions, about two hours a piece, going into more details about the cybersecurity requirements. So please feel free to access those. Um, Next question, is there a way for contractors to look up their supplier performance score? I don't know on, on their side where they can actually find that. Um, Can't they get it and um, where do they post that? Um, my mind is going blank. Um, we're at are the end of, first score? say that again. Are they referring to their Spurs score? Which yeah, because they, can see, they score? can see it on Spurs if they can get in the Spurs. Yeah, into, oh, yeah. in the supplier performance risk system. If they can get in there, it definitely has it in there because the score is That's coming. exactly where it is. Yes, that's yeah. exactly there, where it is. There's another system that is through SAM. I can't think of it right now. Um, where at the end of once they do their performance, they actually rate themselves and then the agency rates themselves. It's for DOD contracts. 
So somebody can chime in. I just can't think of it. My mind has gone blank. Um, I can't think of it right now. She put but CPARS in the chat. CPARS, CPARS. It's a CPARS rating. Because I believe as far as the CPARS process, the firm will um, give their assessment on how they did. And then the contracting officer or the agency will go in and they will put um, their comments as well. So CPARS, they should be able to access that through SAM.gov. And I believe you can work with your PTAC counselor to access that and to find out more about the CPARS ratings. Um, what type of products or services does DLA purchase? Um, you guys wanna? Um, well, DLA as a whole, um, I'm sure pretty much everything. <laughs> Land and Maritime, we're um, like, I'm in land supplier operations, so it's all vehicle, uh, specifically for mine is land, land vehicles. Uh, parts and services for for that. Uh, I know um, the other agencies, as far as DLA is concerned, like they they do clothing, food, troop support, troop support. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty much it could be pretty much anything, anything that the military uses. Hey, Shanda. Don, are you going to go over that in your presentation? Is that a part yes, of your slide? Yes, I was slide? about to say, I'm going to go over that more thoroughly. Okay. Yes, my presentation. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll leave that for the sake of time because Donna will cover that in her presentation at the very end. Um, okay. Next question. We have a small business in California. would like to start working with DLA. We are not a hub zone. Does this put us at a big disadvantage? No. No, not at all. Yeah, and you don't have to be a hub zone certified company to do business with DLA or any federal agency. It's just if there are hub zone set asides where contracts are set aside just for hub zone certified companies to bid on, then you do have to be hub zone certified. But in order to do business with DLA or any federal agency, no, you do not have to have hub zone certification or any certification. Um, just you being a small business. Um, and so I believe Donna will go over a little bit more about that in her presentation. Um, could you please go back to the second slide, the one that lists the URLs I'm writing them down. I think you did that. Um, how can hub zone companies request that certain NSNs become hub zone set aside? What is the process for DLA land and Marizone, maritime for hub zone? Um, requirements to be set aside for specific NSNs? Yeah, that's a Donna question for sure. <laughs> that, that I was going to talk about, but I can just briefly hit on that. Anything over the micro purchase level, um, two, or more, uh, two or more vendors quoting on a solicitation, a buyer should be alerted to take a look at that and say, hey, this could possibly be a set aside for a hub zone. As simple as that. And uh, okay. As I'm going to like, I'm going to make my presentation here, but each hub zone business that is wanting to work and can work with DLA Land and Maritime, there will be a strategy that I'm putting forward and I will talk to you about that when I do my one-on-one -on -one with you of how we're gonna get more set aside, okay? But just two or more okay. quotes, it doesn't mean two or more awards, two or more quotes over the micro purchase level and they should be looking at that as being a set aside mm -hmm. for hub zone, okay? Thank you, Donna. All right, You're next welcome. question. Um, this firm is an 8A federal food service contractor planning to move into a hub zone qualified facility. As we build out the space, what should we put in place to be ready to pursue DLA bakery contracts when we open March 2022? What should we put in place to be ready to pursue DLA? Um, Donna? Yeah, that would be Donna. <laughs> I, I really couldn't hear that question. I heard bakery. Could you, could you do it again, oh. please? This company is an 8A federal food service contractor planning, oh, to 8A, move, okay. planning to move into a hub zone qualified facility 
as they build out the space, what should they put in place to be ready to pursue DLA bakery contracts when they open in March, 2022? Okay, bakery, that sounds like food that would be food support. And I can make sure they get the information for that. I think, good, that's going to, they're going to be a hub zone, but they're probably going to be working with us. We don't do bakery or daily land and maritime, but that is food subsidence. So that is what that would be Philadelphia Troop Support. And you will have that information once I do my presentation on how okay. to reach them. Okay. And I would also recommend okay. that if you're in California, that you work with your, I thought I saw something, California. Okay. Um, well, wherever you are, this 8A Federal Food Service that you work with your PTAC and your BOS um, to ensure that you qualify for hub zone. Jill is going to go over the program requirements just because the facility may be in a hub zone area. You want to make sure that 35% um, of your employees also are in a hub zone area to ensure that you qualify. So make sure that you listen to Jill's presentation and then you work with your BOS and your PTACs also to give you some additional assistance. Um, let's see. I'm kind of going through these. Um, is there a cyber like program for DLA? Um, CIBR and STTR contract, um, excuse me, are um, grants, federal grants that assist individuals maybe that may be doing business um, with research related, um, with research related um, items or services, or if they have a product okay. or whatnot. Right, that would that'd be for me. That is with, with our headquarters for Belvoir. That is who they will contact. And there again, that will be, I'll give them an address, that email link and all, everything they can just know when I present, but okay. that is, will be our headquarters, headquarters office. Awesome, thank you, Donna. So she'll go over more mm -hmm. when she presents that. Um, this company is located in a hub zone, but owners are not 8A. Does that still give the company? Um, just again, to clarify, 8A is a certification. Hub zone is a certification. You do not have to have those certifications to do business with BLA. You do mm -hmm. not have to have businesses to, you don't have to have those certifications to get contracts with DLA or any federal agency. You have those certifications. There are contracts that are set aside for those that are certified in those. And that's a whole nother kind of training on those. Um, but you can still do business with DLA as a small business. Yes, you can. And Donna will give more information about that. Um, and you can continue to work with your PTAC for more clarity on that. I believe that's it for all of the questions in the chat. Okay, and and I, I just have one one more um, thing that I need to say, uh, Shonda. And that is when we're, when we're looking at small businesses in general, uh, one thing that we want to, uh, that we wanna do is we don't wanna be pretty much have our hands tied with the larger businesses, the larger mm -hmm. companies. Uh, because if they go out of business, <laughs> then we're we're just kind of up the creek without a paddle uh, when that when that happens. So we want the small businesses to be able to manufacture these products, uh, these items, so that we don't have to go, you know, be competition for the larger the larger companies. And because you can be set aside for the small uh, small business set asides, then we're looking at you first so as long as you can um like i said performance as long as you can perform uh, as long as we get quality material uh quality items to the warfighter um you guys are first in line we're looking at you first all the time uh whether it's hub zone uh service disabled or just a small business in an area so um that's that's very important we did have another question to come through, Alonzo, and it looks like a good one. Can you expand mm -hmm. upon or clarify, further clarify, when a bid goes to secondary or manual review, going past the automated review to an actual person, um, will you look for responses 
after your presentation. We'll look for a room. I don't, I'm not quite sure I got that question at the very end. If you can expand upon or clarify when a bid goes to secondary or main review after, um, after the automated review and it goes to an actual person, can okay. you explain that process? Okay, so what happens is our system is designed to, to auto evaluate. And as soon as if it gets through the automated system, uh, the automated system can award it. And at that point, for the most part, it's under lowest price technically acceptable. Um, but then when it comes to manual review, uh, we have a, we actually have two teams that actually look at it. So the first team will look at it, see if it can be, if it can be funded or if it can be awarded to someone uh, on that level. And then it goes to the, <laughs> then it comes to like our team, the, the team that I'm on. When it comes to the, when it comes to our team, basically, and it bypasses the second look, then this is where we're looking at your, we're doing best value determinations. We're actually looking at every kind of, you know, everything, um, the past performance, the, the delivery, uh, it can be, and the price. And the reason why we're looking at all three of them um, for the evaluation, it could be something as simple as we're willing to pay for an item, uh, say 5% more because the delivery and the past performance is better on the contractor that actually um, is offering a higher price at that point and is the best value for the government. Uh, and at that same time, you know, the warfighter needs it like yesterday. So we're, we have to take all that stuff into an account uh, when it, when it gets to our desk, uh, when it gets to the buyer's desk and then the contracting officer. And then, uh, one thing that we have to do, and Shonda, you kind of, you kind of explained this, is then we have to justify why we did it. Uh, we have it in writing, uh, we document it all, and, and we try not to bypass people, but if we have to, we have to, uh, because of, of, you know, just, it could be simple things or it could be like the cybersecurity uh, it could be something that simple that just knocks you out. So it's, uh, it, and it changes all the time because the FAR is like a living, breathing document. Um, every time we turn around, policy is changing something else. So um, we could probably do this again next month and I would have something totally different <laughs> because it just constantly changes. But um this is the new thing right now. <laughs> um, no, that's that's great. Um, and that, and as far as you mentioning the FAR, that's another, as a small business, you want to make sure that you're familiar with those FAR clauses, especially some of the general run, ones as it relates to your contract and you have an understanding of those. Um, so that's definitely important. Um, Next question is, I don't, I'm not familiar with this, USL and H insurance, is that required for small businesses to do business with the, um, with DLA? Yeah, that's a Donna question it has to be, I never heard okay, of that. That's either. a real question. I've never, I've never heard of that before. I've never heard of it that either. Is different. I need to know what that acronym stands for. Yeah, I don't know if somebody, if uh, uh, Julian, if you can um, type what the USL and H insurance is, I'm not familiar with that acronym. I don't know if anybody else is on here. Um, it looks like someone has an, this particular company, Niche Enterprise, executes wire harness and cable assemblies along with printed circuit board assembly yeah. and electromechanical. Yes, we do. This is Gerald from Niger Enterprise. Okay. Um, we are hubs on um, been in business 
15 years. So we do work with the DLA, the DOD, um, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, as well as the commercial and the medical industry. And we were endorsed by uh, Kevin Harrington, the TV mogul from the hit TV series Shark Tank. So I just emailed uh, and added those links to the um, to your uh, I guess to your chat box for those who would like to view it. Um, he endorsed our company, and Kevin is the originator of the infomercials back in the '80s, the Genzu uh, knives, you know, the George Foreman grill different things like that. And um, he endorsed our company and they interviewed us on Fox TV and that was aired nationally in 47 states. Uh, just, it was supposed to air right before COVID, but when COVID hit, we pushed the date back. Um, we currently had been written up in NBC, Fox and CBS. Um, they had written publications on us uh, about four months ago on our capabilities and our services. And we're looking to partner with a lot of uh, primes and subprimes. Um, we do first articles for everything. We're our, our hub zone, SDB, and we're AS9100. And we're uh, also just applying for our 8A as well. Okay, wonderful. Great, what I would recommend um, if you could make sure that you listen to Donna's presentation and then you can see how to do business with DLA and I believe they may still have the TKOs, the training knowledge and opportunity trainings that they do and how to do business with DLA so that you can get plugged in for the sake of time, um, because we do have other small companies on here. We do wanna make sure that we allow for just the general questions, but you definitely um, also Donna's emails in the chat. So you can also email her directly, but um, definitely want to give all small companies, everyone that's on today's webinar an opportunity if they'd like to do business Absolutely. with DLA. But thank I you so much. I appreciate you guys' time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we thank appreciate you. it. All right. Okay. Um, and we're going to, just for the sake of time, we're going to ask if you can keep your, um, yeah, your mute on your, uh, as far as your, um, and not ask us questions. We'll just kind of go through the chat only because we do love the engagement, but just for the sake of time, we still have some more presentations. I think this is great interaction. You guys have wonderful questions, but I don't think we'll be able to get um, within the two hour time frame if we were allowed to have everybody just kind of introduce themselves. But um, thank you for that. Um, looks like we've had some additional questions to come through. Um, I think it's great and both Donna and Alonzo can see that there's some really um, wonderful companies that are on here that are interested in doing business with DLA and are looking for opportunities. So you're definitely in the right place um, and participating in today's webinar. Um, does this next question, does having certifications like ISO 9001, 2015 or JCP certify play any role in the selection um, as far as you looking at um, them, Alonzo? Uh, absolutely. Um, okay. The, the reason why I say that is because if on, on the trailers, when we do our solicitation, the trailers call for this stuff. Like they'll call for the ISO uh, 9001, uh, 2015, or it may say that it, you have to be JCP certified. So if you, if you don't have those certifications and you submit a quote, we automatically can't look at it uh, regardless. And you could be the best value or anything, but if you do not have that ISO or that JCP uh, and that solicitation calls for it, then we have to bypass it as well. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a very good question. And I think that is it. Wonderful questions today, excellent questions, a lot of engagement. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the next. If we can ask, um, I'm not trying to call you out, but I just see it's Mr. Samuel Artley. If you can put your, turn off your camera for us. And we just wanna allow those that are presenting to show, cause sometimes it can be a little distracting. But if you can, um, Samuel, if you can put your, Turn your camera off. 
And I think he's looking to see how to do that. <laughs> While he's doing that, let me bring this up. Um, next on the agenda, we do have um, Jill Maggie Reynolds, who's gonna present on the HubZone program eligibility and updates. And Jill is a business opportunity specialist, my counterpart that works here at the Columbus District Office. Um, so Jill, if you wanna go ahead and take it from here. All right, excellent. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the questions, Alonzo. Excellent job. It's just so nice to partner with other agencies. I feel like I learn something every time. So I really appreciate your time. And uh, I'm sure that the small businesses that were able to join today appreciate your time as well. And I wanna just say thank you to everyone that took time out of their day. I know that uh, a lot of you are from outside of Ohio and uh, this presentation today is relevant to all businesses that are interested in doing business with the federal government, regardless of where you're located. So uh, my name is Jill Nagy Reynolds. Just remember the Jill part, that's fine. And I am with the SBA Columbus District Office. There are 58 districts around the United States. And so I would say most districts work very closely with their PTAC offices. Uh, so we just and their federal agencies. So whether you're located in California or Louisiana or Florida, your SBA offices are uh, working closely with federal agencies in that area. And uh, we have the privilege of DLA Land and Maritime being in our backyard. Uh, so the SBA Columbus District Office obviously is in Columbus, Ohio, but DLA Land and Maritime is also in Columbus, Ohio. So we get to partner with each other a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm hoping to clarify, and I'm gonna go through these quickly because Donna is definitely the star of the show. I'm just gonna go over some of the hub zone stuff so that you have an idea of what the eligibility requirements are. If you have any questions afterwards, yes, I'm the one that sent you the notification for this presentation for the webinar today. So you should have my email address saved already, but just in case you don't, it's uh, jill.nagyreynolds at sba.gov. I highly recommend you email me first. Uh, and then if you don't hear from me, uh, uh, go ahead and give me a call. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I did see the one question in the chat that said, um, if I'm not 8A and I'm not hub zone or I'm hub zone but not 8A, uh, just like Shonda mentioned, you don't have to have any of the small business certifications in order to do business with the government. And when I say the government, I mean all of federal government. We're partnering with DLA today, but uh, the SBA small business programs cover all federal agencies. So whether your best customer is DLA or the Navy or Department of the Interior or Health and Human Services, if it's a federal agency, then they have the small business goals outside of like the US Post Office and uh, can't remember the other one. But uh, uh, just to give you an idea, of the small business programs. Uh, so when you do business with the federal government, 23% of all business is set aside for small business by law. So that's 23%. So even if you're not hub zone or woman owned or service disabled veteran owned or, or uh, 8A, you're still, you can still bu do business with the government as a small business. But we're particularly talking about the hub zone program today. Uh, so that is going to be where my primary focus is. And so within that 23%, 3% of all contracts or all contract dollars are set aside for hub zone. Uh, I remember earlier in the presentation, yes, there's parity among set asides, but federal agencies, if they're low on say they, they've met their woman-owned for the year or they met their 8A for the year, but they're low in hub zone, they can work towards uh, that hub zone award, that 3%. Uh, while 3% doesn't sound like a lot, I know that Donna will speak to this, it's hard. It's very hard for federal agencies to meet that 
And part of it is because of the eligibility requirements that SBA has around the hub zone program, which causes a lot of heartburn for both the federal agencies and the small businesses themselves. So I'm going to, I'm the lucky one that gets to go through the eligibility requirements and I'm going to try not to kill anyone with boredom. So, uh, and I'm going to try and go through it fast so that uh, we have the time we need with Donna. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we talked about that one. Go ahead, uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna keep you on your toes, Sharon. Okay, so the purpose of the Hub Zone program. So I, I get a lot of questions like, okay, how does that relate to HUD? Well, HUD is housing and urban development, uh, but HUB is a historically underutilized business zone. So it is one of SBA's or it's one of the federal government small business programs. I should say SBA is the, is the agency that implements HUBZone. Uh, but so the program itself was launched by Congress in 1997 and then officially launched in 1999. So it stands for Historically Underutilized Business Zone. Uh, so it does have federal agencies are able to set aside contracts for hub zone certified small businesses. So yes, it is a certification program. The goal that the government has then is, is that in turn, small businesses will invest in and hire from uh, qualified hub zones. And then also the communities uh, benefit from job opportunities and investments. Next slide, please. Hub zone, unlike some of the other programs, you're either in a hub zone or you're not and it's based on your address. So at any given time, there are around 22,000 communities around the United States that are designated hub zone. SBA has a hub zone map. If you go to sba.gov and then backslash hub zone, you can click on the map function and type your address in. It'll either have, and, it's, it's, and I have slides for this, it's gotta be your principal office. So uh, uh, your principal office, by definition, is where the greatest number of your employees work. Uh, and I will tell you, all of you are welcome to have a copy of these slides when I'm done. So uh, this is just a screenshot of the hub zone map, uh, but it shows you everything that's in red. Uh, those are, those are uh, county designations. Blue are as individual census tracts. So uh, throughout the country, there, there are some entire counties that are designated hub zone, which is actually the best for the small business as it is located in that county because then it's easier to get your employees residing in a hub zone if the entire county is a uh, hub zone. But uh, most areas in the United States are, are uh, qualified based on the US Census tract. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Okay, in order for a business to be qualified uh, for the hub zone program, the business must be small. So none of you at this presentation should be brand new to government because uh, I sent this out through the dynamic small business search, which meant that someone in your company registered your business in SAM and uh, your company is considered small. But uh, small business uh, is based on your primary North American Industry Classification Code or NAICS code. So uh, if you have any questions uh, about what it means to be small or how the SBA looks at uh, small, uh, please send me an email. But there is no official certification that SBA has for small business. That is a self-certification that goes through your system for award management registration. So when your company registers in the system for award management, one of the sections of the uh, registration will ask you what your five-year revenue is uh, for your business. It may still ask three-year. It changed to five-year in January of 2021. And if you are a manufacturing company, it's based on your number of employees. 
And the threshold for employees is fairly high. So some of the manufacturing codes have 150 employees. Some of them go up to 500 employees. Uh, Donna, it may actually go up to 750. I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, she may know that, okay? So number one, your business must be small. It must be 51% owned and controlled by US citizens. Indian tribal government, Alaska Native Corporation, Native Hawaiian Organization, Community Development Corporation, or an agricultural cooperative. I will tell you in Ohio, uh, we, we work primarily with the, uh, the US citizens. We don't have much uh, tribally owned land here. Um, and so obviously not part of the Alaska Native Corporation. So you must be small, you must have a principal office, which is uh, the, where the greatest number of your employees work has to be located in a hub zone. And, and this is an and, not an or, 35% of your employees must reside in a hub zone. They can reside in any hub zone in the country. And the other thing I want to, we have, I have a slide with this, but uh, the SBA defines a hub zone employee as anyone that works for you at least 40 hours a month and they have to be on payroll. So payroll employee at least 40 hours a month. And uh, like I said, I'll have a slide dedicated to that, but uh, just that, that uh, is a unique definition to hub zone is 40 hours a month. Next slide, please. Okay, what defines small? I see that question. So it, it depends, like uh, it depends on the industry that you're in, Alex. So if you're in manufacturing, uh, the SBA defines small by your North American industry classification system, code or NAICS, N-A-I-C-S. Uh, and it's not just if you're, I'm sorry, the SBA defines then whether in, if you're in supply or services, but if you're in manufacturing, it's based on the number of employees you have. If you're in services, say you're in construction, IT, marketing, engineering, uh, food service, it would be based on your five-year uh, average gross receipts. And uh, Jane from PTAC actually just put the size standard table, the SBA size standard table into the chat. Thank you very much. What you can do for, with that is click on it. And I believe you can do a control F uh, it's a uh, PDF file and you can search by keyword. So you can look at, to, say you're in marketing, you can search by marketing and you can see what types of NAICS codes there are for marketing, et cetera. So any question you have about that, your local PTAC can help you with it. Your, your SBA office can help you with it. And the SBA website is actually really good, uh, sba.gov. It has um, a whole contracting section. So uh, for HUBZone certification, uh, first, you have to have your entity registered in SAM. And for this year, it's easier said than done with all the changes they've done. But SAM.gov is the portal by which your company can start doing business with the federal government. It's very important. And if you are a manufacturing company, you will have to take it a step further if you want to do business with DLA and you need to get set up in dibs which is the Defense Internet Bid Board System. I'm pretty sure Donna will talk about that uh, more. So registration in SAM. Um, a, well, no, I'm sorry. This second section here is for your actual HUBZone application. So when you're registering for the HUBZone program, you have your SAM registration good to go. Then you can apply for the HUBZone certification through the uh, HUBZone portal. So SBA does approve or deny hub zone certification applications. SBA also monitors your hub zone certification. So at the Columbus district, I am a hub zone liaison. I don't do any of the paperwork part. I just verify hub zone uh, principal office locations. The application and monitoring of your certification is all done at the hub zone office in Washington, DC. Next slide, please. Okay, procurement tips for hub zone. And this isn't just hub zone. This is any business that wants to do business with the government. And so I appreciate that SBA put through hub zone in there, but really it, it holds true to anybody. Visit the SBA website. I mean, there's tons of information on it. Get to know your district office. Get to know your PTAC, especially. 
And hopefully, I mean, we have, I, I don't mean to brag, but I think we probably have about the best PTAC in the, in the country, uh, the OU PTAC and the, just the PTAC network, network in Ohio is really good. But so, so are the other PTAC networks. And it's not just like PTACs can help you and it's paid for. They're actually funded by the Department of Defense uh, in part. So uh, it just, they can help you not only with, with DLA, but also with all of the other agencies, your capability statement. We've talked about it enough, so I'm gonna stop. Okay, do your homework, find out about the agencies you wanna do business with. As Alonzo said, DLA's mission is to support the warfighter. When you understand, you need to understand the mission of the agencies that you want to do business with. Uh, they will appreciate that so much when you have an interaction with them. Because you don't want to lead with, if you finally get the opportunity to meet with a Donna or an Alonzo, you don't want to say, I'm 8A or I'm Hub Zone. Where are my opportunities? If you're doing that, we need to kick you right back to PTAC so you can learn how to, how to present yourself. You need to have a capability statement. You need to talk about how wonderful your, your company is, how you can provide support or supplies that, that the agency that you're trying to do business with, what they need, and you do that by researching. All federal agencies have websites that you can just really dive down and learn an awful lot about. I'm not going to talk a lot about number four, which is the All Small Mentor Protege Program. SBA has an All Small Mentor Protege Program where you, as a, a small business, it's not just for Hub Zone, uh, it's for small business, Hub Zone, 8A, woman owned small business, and service disabled, veteran owned small business. Uh, if you lack the capacity, you as a business lack the capacity to bid on on federal contracts, you may have the capacity for some, but uh, with the way that uh, the government is currently buying with uh, 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 single source, I'm sorry, not, but uh, what is that? I can't think of it, but they're, they're doing a lot of IDIQ contracts, uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, where you have to have a lot more capabilities than uh, you as a small business may have. So the SBA All Small Mentor Protege Program allows for small businesses to partner with each other and form joint venture agreements to go after contracts together, okay? And I will say, if you have questions about that, uh, our partnership with PTAC, after the, we, we have a lot of uh, recorded trainings, I think there's one including the All Small Mentor Protege Program on OU PTAC's website, but then there also is a training on the All Small Mentor Protege Program on SBA's website. Yes, leverage your small business status, but don't lead with it. You want to say what a great manufacturer of gears you are or whatever it is you do first. And then you say, oh, and I'm also hub zone or, oh, I'm also 8A or, or I'm also a small business, whatever it is that uh, your designations are. Next slide, please. Okay, if you need help with hub zone, uh, with the application, um, you can call your district office. Uh, you can also go to the sba.gov uh, backslash hub zone website. That is also where you can go to uh, uh, verify the maps. Um, you, can, you can ask technical questions, uh, hub zone questions to your district office, but if you get me too far into the weeds, uh, then I'm gonna refer you to uh, that hubzone and sba.gov email, uh, the, that is actually answered by hubzone analysts. So when I mean by hubzone analysts, they're the ones that process the hubzone certification applications. Uh, so if it's a owner, a really technical ownership question, if, if, you know, there's like 80 owners and they're all, you, you know what I mean, it can get kind of uh, hairy. So if you have a lot of questions, like a really technical question, I would just back bypass the district office and ask the hub zone office directly. And they do have weekly conference calls uh, so that uh, uh, any potential hub zone vendor, if they have questions, they can ask the analyst directly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so there have been some program changes. Next slide. So as you saw at the beginning, the Hub Zone program's been around since 1997. One of the things I mentioned, uh, uh, that 3% goal for Hub Zone, 
Uh, part of the reason why it's really hard for agencies to get it is because it's hard for small businesses to maintain it. So uh, the hub zone maps uh, after these program changes are a little bit more stable than they used to be. Uh, it used to, and I, you know, I made the reference to HUD. Uh, the hub zone program does use a HUD report in determining their uh, census tracts, which is great for HUD, but not so great for hub zone. So they are trying to uh, streamline the maps so that they don't change as often. So if you go into the hub zone map function with SBA and you plug your address in and it says qualified census tract or it says qualified uh, county and it's either red or it's, it's solid red or a solid blue, you're good to go. If you go into the hub zone map area and you plug your address in and you see like diagonal lines through it, it's blue with like lighter blue diagonal lines or white lines. Uh, that means that it, uh, it's a redesignated hub zone. Uh, so usually if you're in that area, the clock is ticking in terms of you being eligible in the future. Like your, elegy, your principal office is eligible now, but in two years, the hub zone maps are going to update and you're no longer going to be hub zone or the principal office location won't be. So they're trying to, they have streamlined that, that it went into effect in 2020. The hub zone maps were frozen uh, for an entire year. They were unfrozen in January, 2021. So they're, they're pretty much current as of right now. So as I mentioned, federal agencies have had a hard time meeting that 3% uh, goal. And because of the fluidity of uh, uh, the hub zone principal office location, it made it hard for companies to, to uh, remain compliant with the program. Next slide, please. How am I on time? Ooh, I talk a lot. So uh, hub zone, we're trying to improve the customer service experience expand and stabilize a hub zone footprint. And uh, we, the SBA wants to increase program utilization as much as the agencies want to have small businesses qualify for hub zone. Next slide, please. So now with the, uh, and these, these changes went into effect at late last year, uh, December, 2020, we made, some of them went into effect uh, October 2020. So now when you apply for hub zone certification, it should be within 60 days of a complete submission. What does that mean? Okay, that means from the time you have submitted your application, like an analyst might say, okay, ABC company, you're missing your operating agreement. So you got to send them your operating agreement. Your time haven't, hasn't started yet if they have to ask you for that. Um, streamline platform SBA is still working on transitioning to a user friendly interface. We still have the old uh, uh, GLS system for for HubZone. Uh, I know the intent is to move HubZone over to the other uh, platform that SBA has called Certify. Uh, and then early support. Your PTAC offices, a lot of them receive training in HubZone. So a lot of them uh, can talk to you about the eligibility requirements or application. So if after this you discover that you're qualified for HubZone and you need some help, I recommend your PTAC office or your SBA district office. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Again, we're trying to stabilize the maps, expand into rural areas, and recognize long-term investment in communities. So another thing that the Hub Zone program has done, say your principal office, um, that, yeah, just so yeah, if your principal office uh, is, uh, when you plug it in, if you actually own the building, um, then the SBA has put into place like a, a, a the ability for that business to remain in the hub zone, remain in the hub zone program for up to 10 years if you own the building. Uh, but uh, I would need to talk to you uh, about that a little bit more. So again, with this, with this uh, update, the maps are only updated every five years instead of uh, every six weeks, which it seemed like it was before. And I mentioned redesignated areas. Uh, so 
the concept remains. There's a three year transition period for expiring hub zone qualified census tracts and qualified non metropolitan counties. When you plug your address into the hub zone map, you will know right away whether or not your, your principal office is in a hub zone. Next slide, please. Uh, so the new category, oh, the other thing that happened is now governors uh, can uh, appeal to the SBA to get areas within their state designated hub zone. And it just seems to vary based on the state. Uh, I know Ohio, I believe once a year, uh, they ask SBA, hey, can you make these areas uh, designated hub zone? And a lot of times the businesses will ask the, the governor's office, hey, look, I have this business and I could really benefit from hub zone, but it's not considered a hub zone area. Could you apply to the SBA to see if we could become hub zone? But there are certain criteria. It's got to be a rural community of 500,000 residents or less. Unemployment rate of 120% of the state or US average. Opportunity zones are encouraged and governors must petition the SBA. So uh, that is still a new program. And this actually launched at the very beginning, you know, right before COVID. So I'm not sure exactly what that looks like yet. I haven't been able to uh, get a follow up from the uh, headquarters office to see how many governors have utilized that. Um, and then small businesses, here we go, small businesses that invest in hub zones by purchasing a building or enter a long term lease of 10 years or more may maintain hub zone eligibility for up to 10 years. Now, I have been asked, there was a company that called that uh, was qualified for hub zone, but they were in a redesignated area already. If you're already in a redesignated area, then that rule does not apply. Uh, okay, see, and the next bullet says does not apply to buildings already currently in redesignated areas. So you have to be careful. Like when you're looking at the hub zone map, if you plug that address in and you see that it's redesignated, that 10 year rule does not apply. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now they also changed it to an annual recertification. This is huge for HubZone because it used to be another thing that made it really tough is that uh, for contracting officers to be able to award a HubZone uh, uh, contract, the HubZone business had to be eligible at the time of submission of initial offer and at the time of award. That can be problematic when there is sometimes months or even years in between submission of initial offer and award. So SBA changed that. So as long as you is the hub zone was qualified at the time of initial offer uh, with price, and that that company will still be qualified even if they are no longer in the hub zone program at the time of award. And uh, SBA does uh, uh, certify on an annual basis. Um, you don't have to reach out to SBA directly. They will reach out to you. If you don't hear from them uh, within that year, you're still in good standing with the, eight, with the uh, hub zone program. You just have to wait to hear from them. Uh, SBA does uh, confirm eligibility with contracting officer. Uh, and then there's also a change in the residency requirements for legacy employees. So uh, if the employee, if you, if you get into the hub zone program, um, if you get into the hub zone program and uh, it's based on an employee that was residing at the, in a hub zone at the time you obtained your certification, if that hub zone employee moves to a non-hub zone area, they still count as a hub zone employee for your certification. So that is another change. It used to be if your hub, if your employee moved out of the hub zone, then that that messed with your 35%. Uh, that they changed that. Okay. So firms must annually recertify, as I mentioned, wait for SBA to reach out to you. Uh, Full documentation reviews will be required every three years. I will tell you if you're actively getting contracts through the HubZone program, that's really when SBA cares. If you are not getting HubZone contracts, uh, because I, I have to do the HubZone site visits uh, for uh, Central and Southern Ohio, 
uh, the ones that I do the hubs on site visits for, and I'm told by headquarters, okay, you need to go here, here, here. Uh, it's always ones that have uh, contracts. Um, so once a company is certified, a firm will be eligible for uh, uh, contracts for up to a period of one year until you're recertified. Uh, and then the other thing, and I know I'm going through these quick. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, backtrack. Let me read here. So no, you're, you're good. You can make, you can put it on there, Sharon. It's fine. Go to the next one. So SBA, once you're certified in the hub zone program, the SBA, hopefully you've all heard of the dynamic small business search because that's how I sent the meeting notification out to you anyway. So the dynamic small business search or that DSBS is at the top there, that, that is SBA's uh, platform. So when you register your business in SAM, you automatically get a dynamic small business search profile. SBA controls that to some extent. So if, you're, if your company becomes HubZone certified or 8 a certified, those dates of certification will show up in the dynamic small business search. I get calls from federal agencies all the time that say, hey, their 8A certification or HUBZone certification did not show up in SAM. Well, SAM is not the authority on SBA small business programs that dynamic small business search is because SBA controls that. So uh, when your company gets certified in HUBZone, it will show up in your dynamic small business search profile as the date that you became certified. So once you go through the certification process, you get approved, it'll show up in the DSBS and your contracting officers can check that. And uh, it'll say if the company is hub zone or not. So SBA does determine the eligibility of a concern if there's a hub zone protest. Protest just very quickly. Uh, members of the public cannot submit a protest on, uh, against another company just because they suspect that they may not be hub zone. There is a process in place. So if, if, if you are bidding on a hub zone set aside contract and you do not believe that the awardee is actually hub zone and you also submitted a bid, but you didn't get awarded, you can protest uh, that hub zone status. And that's the only way that you can do that. You can't be like going through SAM.gov or the dynamic small business search and saying, hey, I don't think this ABC company is actually hub zone and just send that to the SBA. You have to have some sort of uh, uh, evidence. I just want to find out if you are going to share the link. I'm not sure which link you mean. I'm sorry. It's really, <laughs> tell me which link you mean. Um, uh, the other thing, a firm that receives a hub zone contract must attempt to maintain 35%. So SBA changed that rule. So SBA used to be really black and white with that 35%. So if you lose, if you're, if your company was right at 35%, if you lost one employee and you went down to 34.5% hub zone, you are no longer compliant. Uh, the SBA changed that to attempting to maintain, okay, you have to attempt to maintain at least 20% of your employees at any given time for HubZone. That means if you lose some of your employees, have a plan in place how you're going to find additional HubZone residents. Um, so you can still perform the contract, you can still bid on additional hub zone work, but you have to be telling the SBA how you're attempting to maintain, and hopefully it's just a very short period of time that you're below that 35%. Next slide, please. We're, we're just going to go ahead. No, this is a little bit too technical. We're not going to go through these today. Um, these are different contract types and, they, and really they're not used a whole lot for DLA, so we're not going to talk about that. Okay, excellent. Next, keep going. I love to tell people about the regulations. So Alonzo mentions uh, the FAR. Uh, I will tell you SBA, we are ruled by the FAR and the CFR mostly because all of our programs fall under the Code of Federal Regulations. So anytime you have a question about uh, the hub zone program, yes, you can contact the district office, but the other thing you can do is look it up yourself. Um, uh, with our electronic age, like the CFR now is updated every other day, you can go to ecfr.gov. 
Uh, and Shonda, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, ecfr.gov. Shonda and I live on ecfr.gov. Uh, but you know, we, that's, that's just what gets us up and moving in the morning. Uh, but you can always ask your district office. Uh, the hub zone program falls under 13 CFR part 126. It has all of the eligibility requirements. Uh, so it talks about the principal office definition, the employee definition, uh, when uh, a contracting officer can award something into the hub zone program. Uh, and then also, if you were curious about size regulations, as I'm sure all of you are, because why wouldn't you be, uh, you can check out 13 CFR Part 121. Uh, we're on that on a regular basis, especially with joint venture agreements. Um, that always makes it a little bit more fun. So um, and then you have the recent uh, rules around the, the governor designated areas and then the hub zone improvements, which I just went over briefly. Next slide, please. Thank you, Shonda. Okay, so we got into this just a little bit with Alonzo and Shonda and I with uh, Hub Zone Sole Source Authority. So, yes, there is sole source authority under Hub Zone. Uh, so, it can be either 100% Hub Zone set aside or partial uh, set aside. I will tell you these are SBA rules. So how federal agencies use SBA rules, because I know that DLA does things a little bit differently. You know, DLA does things differently than the Air Force does, then it, it just, but these are SBA's rules, uh, which have to be followed because it's SBA's program. Now, it, each federal agency can expand on these rules if they want, but uh, these are SBA's rules uh, for HUBZone. So uh, for full and open competition, and, and I am gonna talk a little bit about price evaluation preference. It's the only small business set aside program that the SBA has that has that. So uh, there is a 10% price evaluation process, uh, preference that's applied on full and open competition requirements. So it's gotta be a full and open competition requirement, not a small business requirement, not a woman owned, not 8A, it's full and open and you will see and SAM.gov under the, the uh, whatever the new FedBizOps, it's SAM, but it's now con the contracting section is SAM. It will tell you inside of the notices whether it is, and inside of DIBs too, it'll say if it's uh, as a uh, full and open competition, small business, hub zone, et cetera. So if it's a full and op open competition requirement, then there is a 10% price evaluation preference. There are also reserves for uh, small business concerns under multiple award contracts. Those are idea indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. If I'm, if I'm throwing out a lot of acronyms, welcome to this world. It's definitely not going to be your last interaction. Contact a PTAC uh, because, again, the federal government can seem overwhelming, but that's why we have these resources out there and, you know, welcome to the party. Uh, set aside orders for hub zone, small business concerns against a multiple award contract. Again, I'm not going to get too technical here, but there are hub zone pools within these multiple award contracts. So if you are a hub zone company, then you could get into that hub zone pool and a small business pool. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not sure I did an excellent job at that, but uh, uh, for hub zone and simplified acquisition, um, the contracting officer may award a hub zone set aside or sole source award. And see, it's a difference between may and shall. So above the simplified acquisition threshold, the contracting officer shall first consider a set aside before a hub zone sole source award or set aside the requirement is a small business set aside. So that, that simplified acquisition threshold is a, a key number in the small business programs. Next slide, please. Oh my gosh, it's 1242. Okay, yeah. I, I don't wanna take away from, <laughs> from Donna anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know what, that's, again, my presentation will be available. Is there, are there questions in the chat, Shonda? No, I just went ahead. I think for the sake of time, yes. I included your name, your phone number and your email. And if you don't mind, no. I think we can shift to Donna's because, um, and then just ask everyone, uh, because we may go over a few minutes, if you don't mind, just still staying. If you have time, we may go over just a few minutes, but we do want to allow 
Donna the chance to talk. Thank you so much, Jill. It is a lot. Great information. She tried to condense it and I know go over, but as you can see, there's a lot of just additional information, additional, there's always additional things um, typically when you're doing business with the government. So um, just more of an emphasis for you to work with your PTAC. So um, without further ado, thank you again, um, Jill. And I know we did have a lot of questions during Alonzo. So it's been a great presentation, but I think they're getting ready to share Donna. And I'm just going to forego introducing Donna. I do want to say that Donna is, I will read this, she is a um, the small business professional in the Office of Small Business Programs with DLA Land and Maritime here in Columbus. So with that, Donna, you can go ahead and take it from here. I'd like that. That was, can you hear me pretty good, Shanda? Yes. Yep. If you can make, um, I I like that. that, Go ahead. No, I was going to ask them if they can make her presentation full on the screen, and maybe they have. It's just the way it looks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the first slide, most likely. Okay. (laughs) I like that introduction. I didn't realize it would take this much time, but it's really, but the good questions, you know, and it's always important to let people ask questions because they need answers. But all the questions that is pertains to Alonzo or myself, if you, can't, if you reach out to Alonzo, he'll be happy to answer your questions that you didn't get didn't ask or get answered, and as well as myself, because I plan, as I said before, to talk to every one of you that are a match and those of you that are not a match for DLA Land and Maritime, Maritime, because there's a match somewhere else in one of our sister agencies. So I will be doing a one-on-one with everyone. I'm just that serious about making sure we make this go. Okay, let's get started. Thank you so much. Jill, I've never heard her talk so fast. She has so much to say, but it's all very, very needful, very necessary. She does it with just expertise. It's awesome, full of knowledge. So thank you very much, Jill. Okay, here we go. Let's get going because I know these people probably are probably hungry. Okay, good afternoon. I am Donna Bruno Blackwell, the Hub Zone Program Manager, and I'm also, I don't know if the SBA knows this, I'm also the SBA Program Manager. How did I get to? I don't know, but I have to. Um, I'm very, 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 very pleased that we have as many people as we have participating in the webinar. It is so very important. So we, I look forward to working with you. You couldn't be, it's not a better time to be a hub zone business. Let me tell you why. Uh, command, you know, for too long, number one, too long, we have not made our goal. We have not made the 3% mandate goal. So basically, flip the I'm sorry, change the slide because I don't went on to the, to the uh, agenda. Like basically, why is this, why is this webinar? The agenda? Kind of? Okay, good. So anyway, too long, uh, to my knowledge, and since I've been with GLA and I was a buyer first before being a um, small business person, but I spent a lot of time versus buying and communicating with the, with the vendors to make sure they got the help they needed. So um, it was determined with myself and command that, you know, they heard me talking to vendors and said that you need to be a small business. I totally concur with that. So thus I end up in small business, which I like much better and it gives me an opportunity to use my talent talking. Anyway, so as I said before, this cannot be a better time than to be a hub zone uh, vendor. Being that command has uh, stipulated that they want to make it go. I've been saying this for years since I've been downstairs, but four years to five about no no longer five or six years downstairs in, in small business. And we have never met our goal. And to my knowledge, this particular program has never met its goal. And I didn't understand that. And I based upon what it what it does. And this was not a program that was given to me. This is a program I asked for. I do that kind of stuff. I ask for the most challenging thing there is. Number one is because what the the mission of the Hub Zone program, who they service, our warfighters, our men and women in uniform, that's first and foremost, and also equally to me in developing communities, gain for employment. These are things that I support. These are things I supported before I came to the government, and I still was in a position now to get a program that I could possibly do that. However, I didn't know how hard it would be to do this. As Jill, as Jill said, it is very difficult to make it go. But as I said before, command is on board with the Hub Zone program. They want to make the goal so to the to the tune of that every 
directorate that we work with, my mother just came out, every directorate that we work with was mandated to put together a plan of how they're going to increase the hub zone numbers. And that plan is talked about, and everybody is briefed it. Every three months, we meet with a man. That's called the SBAC, okay? Small Business Advisory Council. And they have all the directors talk about what they're doing, how they're doing, their successes, and things that didn't work out so well. So that shows you that they're on board with, this, with the Hub Zone program. I'm so grateful for that. So the basic agenda is who we are, what we do, getting started, find current DLA federal opportunities, seeking assistance, and the conclusion. I was about to wrap. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. And that is, next slide. This is our mission. Next slide, there you go. This is our mission to deliver readiness on the Salisbury to the warfighter always and support our nation through quality, proactive global logistics. And as well, the mission statement, we all need one. As the nation's comeback logistics support agency and value partner, we are innovative, adaptable, agile, and accountable. Focus on the warfighter first, always. Okay, next slide. It's my computer. There you go. It's kind of low. Okay, there you go. There it is. Okay. Okay, the major subordinate commands, the MSCs is what we call them. Uh, I'm located in the DLA land in Maritime Columbus. That's on the left there. DLA Aviation at Richmond, Virginia. DLA Troop Support, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And our DLA Energy Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Those are major support commands. I'm gonna try to make sure I say I don't wanna go too long over, but this is not a good thing. Okay, next slide. There you go, she got it. Major support and commands. There again, this is the address information that you need to know to reach them. Make sure you keep this handy because it could come a good use to you. All right? Let's go on with this. The next slide, please. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, here we go. And these are, again, the DLA overview of the global supply chains and what they do, what they procure, basically. And we have, as you see, their aviation, they're mostly aircraft, engines, things of that nature, anything aircraft related. And also they deal with bearings. I think they're the, they're, they're the, house, they're the house for bearings because we used to do it, but now it's them that do that. As you see, us, the road vehicles, valves, hardware, things of that nature. I, oops, my computer went black. Wait a minute. Come back. Okay. Okay. So, Land of Maritime, we just said before, your motors, electronics, packet, packaging, gaskets, and things of that nature, nuts, bolts, and washers, and things, and converters, and so much more. And we have with uh, Philadelphia, that's our big one, that's just uh, clothing and textiles, uh, medical and substances as it pertains to food for our, for our men and women in uniform and construction and equipment. And as you notice, the energy over to the far right, they were our big spin before, but now since with all the medical, you can understand with the, with the pandemic and things of this nature going on, medical is the big one. That is the biggest one because it was energy, but now it is Philadelphia troop support. Next, next slide, please. I find that there's something slow. Okay. Other acquisition support we have here is information and technology. We have a lot. When I go with users to go uh, in the past, when we were going to, going to these different uh, sessions and webinars and seminars and matchmaking events and things of that nature, I got a lot of IT people. So we have an area that takes care of that information technology. That's a DLA DCSO small business office. So feel free to contact them. If uh, this is what you want to sell to us, construction services below, that is uh, Philadelphia as well. So make sure you contact them if this is something you're interested in doing, construction services, like <clears throat> taking care of buildings and things of that nature. Okay, next slide. You see I'm going through these relatively quickly. 
And also, you know, the professional services that we have here, um, military surplus, as is dealing with the disposition services. Uh, and we also seek unique, rare materials. And it's interesting, you know, because we need these things, it's hard to get them. So we're always in the market for that. And if you can sell that to us, this is the area where you go to contact them for that. And again, these slides will be available to you. So let's talk about getting started. Okay, next slide. And as Gio said to you before, before you can sell to DLA to the government, you must have a DUNS number. That's very, very important. You can't do that without that. And it shows you where there, where to get it from Don, Don and Bradstein. Okay, next slide. Also, you must get a cage. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yes, that's correct. Register on SAMS, you must get a cage, and that's when you register on SAMS to get that cage. And as uh, I think Jill said before, that the SAM, the www.sam.gov goes into beta.sam.gov. And if you go on the SAM.gov, it automatically takes you to beta.sam.gov. So don't worry about it if you forget the beta.sam.gov. I'm still getting used to it myself. Okay? Let's we'll see the head of the game. Okay, Shari went to the next slide. Good. Okay, you can update your small business, uh, small business profile. You would register on the SBA here. That is so very, very important. We need to know what the commodities are. Okay, so make sure you register on SAM, on the SBA, on the SBA. That's very, very, very important. And make sure you, I've also worked with a lot of people that their, their, their area was blank. And I didn't understand that. It's like, you need to update your information to make sure it's there and it's seen that everyone can see it. Next slide. Well, she's ahead of me. Okay, these are some of the items you can enter on as it comes to the SBA. Small business provide your capabilities, your performance history. This provides the location to promote a company. This is the highest contract and lowest contract shows your range of capabilities, okay? Make sure you keep it current. Next slide. Okay, now this one is like our Bible besides the FAR. As Jill talked about the small business dynamic, small business search, this is where all of the buyers go to to look when it comes to market research. Market research is so very important to the contracting officer. And if information is not there readily available for them to see, they use in most cases, they keep it moving. And which means we lose a lot of awards because sometimes information as it pertains to hub zones is not there, okay? Or you haven't made yourself look as good as you can. Our business opportunity specialist, as well as peak tech number one, as well as our business opportunity specialist can help you with that. If you need to like brush up on your capabilities and you want to make it look real nice, that's the peak tech number one. And then our business opportunity specialist can also help. We have about um, six small business specialists, such as myself, and we have two a new, we just had a special new one because we're going to be doing more work and pertain to researching businesses to make sure that they're fit for daily land maritime. So we had two small business opportunity specialists, so that is great. But that is your area for market research. Next slide. Wait a minute. I don't know what is Okay, there we go. And this is how it comes up, okay? Someone does the research and there it comes, and that's the name of the business there, and it shows the capabilities and everything. And that's what I was talking about there when it said, I said sometimes it's blank, it's blank. And that's not good. That means that they haven't taken the time to really advertise and promote themselves. That's very important that you do that. Okay, next slide. Okay. Now, this is Dibs. I used to call this, when I first got into the small business office, I used to call it, they call me Mr. Dibs, because this is where your bread and butter is, okay? Everything that the government sells is on Dibs. Everything, okay? And you must register in DIBS. There's all different types of ways to register, and there's so much you can do on DIBS, DLA, Internet Bid Board System. Okay? Okay, next. You see down there, you said we're in the registration, online help. There's so many different things you can do on DIBS. Okay, next slide. Okay, here we go. This is the things you can do on DIBS. Everything we do on DIBS here is uh, do solicitations and submit quotes. And but then, you know, like some of our smaller quotes, like the 4,000 and below and all that, you can usually quote them right there on that system 
and winning awards. Real quick, I, I like to call them rapid quotes. I don't know why they don't call them that. I call them rapid quotes. And you can get awards real quickly. Uh, do RFPs, requests for proposals, do long term contract opportunities, uh, do the hit award history. And I would advise everyone take a look at your award history before you ask for the quote. Take a look at it. It's important. You want to know what you're dealing with. Access drawings and technical folders, see folders. As we know, there's been some difficulty that some people have had accessing this. And when you do have that problem, get in touch with the small business office, myself. And I will make sure we get you to the right place to get that taken care of. And also that SRVA, the access forecast estimate information. Um, what I want to say about that, yes. Remember, before you go out and spend the baby's uh, college fund, make sure that this is only a guesstimate, okay? This is a forecast. Forecast change. I've had a couple of business companies and say, hey, I went out and bought all this material and because you said in your forecast you were going to do this and now it changed. That happens. The federal government, another acronym is change. We change a lot. But in most cases, the forecast is kind of right on the point. But there are some instances where they change. So don't go and spend, sell the house and all that to make sure you get that material, okay? Let's see what else. Also, the SPURS there, the access to um, the supplier performance risk system, SPURS. That's very, very important. And this makes it your vendor scorecard. And you want to know that. And it's amazing that it's a lot of people who have never heard of it, have never looked at it, especially for people who have been doing business with us on, on, you know, on the regular. Some of them have not seen it. They have not paid much attention to it, but you need to know how you look. Now, I know how you look, because I have a way of getting your page code, when you give it to me, then I can tell how you're doing with us and outside of with us, okay, with other agencies. But I want you to know, we're not, we cannot give you the information that we have or give you the score that you have, okay? Because I have people asking, Donna, give you the score. I won't give you the score, but I sure can tell you when you're very low. And I definitely can tell you if you're looking good, but I can't give you your score, but you can get your score. And if it's a score that you are not happy with, I can help you get to the means of getting that corrected. So you can be very, you can be viewed very favorably in the eyes of the contracting officer. As hub zones of the vendors, you struggle as it is. We, won't, we really don't want anything to stay in your way that's gonna cause you to lose, not be viewed favorably for an award like your score okay let's go to the next slide okay find current dna federal opportunities okay let's go here okay here we go how much solicitation types at dla supply center and i think jill went over that a little bit somewhat request for quotations those, those are under two hundred fifty thousand. On the request for proposals, RFPs are over 250000 And again, as I said before, the most common type uh, that we bought, we award is $4,000. It's not very much, but we do award the big ones a lot. Okay, and they're, as I said before, they're generally quoted directly on our DIP website. And the solicitation must be completed and returned by the determined date and time. That is so imperative because there's so many, you have competition out there. And if you can't get yours in on time, then of course, they would look at the ones who can. So if you have a problem or something malfunctions in your system and you, you immediately contract that, uh, that contracting officer that should be on that solicitation and let them know, I'm having difficulty with this. Can I mail this? And in most cases, they'll be lenient and let you go ahead and mail it if you have a systematic problem. They'll let you do it. They'll let you send an email to them or something. They usually would do that in most cases. 90% of the time, they'll do that, okay? And just know the proposals may be negotiated. In fact, they're encouraging to negotiate. If they think you're, you're too high or your day's delivery is too, too long, then they're negotiating with you. Nothing wrong with good, healthy negotiation. That's the American way. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. How GLA uh, material sub subordinate commands by, okay, by approved case code. That means basically we do not own the drawings. However, we do try to purchase the drawings. But sometimes that the drawings are already negotiated and we can't do it. And approved sources for dealers as well as distributors. Fully competitive, that's when we do have our drawings, and that's usually the 1G and 2Gs of that nature. 
and they, they are published with solicitation. Okay, draw, as I said, they're drawing our development for open data package. Source control via approved sources. We own the drawings, but only certain manufacturers can, you know, really do this to work at this area. Okay, qualified product manufacturers list PPLs, CMLs. These are businesses for businesses who've done that extra training, that's an extra certification to work with these particular items. And if you're interested in the, yeah, the QPL list or uh, learning more about that, I do have a link for you. Just send me, shoot me an email and I'll make sure I get that for you, okay? Okay, I'm trying not to go too long over it. Okay, here we go. Let's go with the uh, four types of contract. The competitive hub zone, if we know what that, I think Jill went over that somewhat. Where well, there's two or more qualified hub zone small business offers and we'll submit offers and the contract will be awarded at a fair price. And that's where a lot of places too we get our uh, set aside, okay? So source, again, the, the, someone asked about the social sub zone contract. I see very few of them because I, our, our, our agency is driven on competition, competition, competition. However, there has been cases where we have got the social, social, social source of zone contract. I want to get more because other people can get them. We can get them too. We just gotta make sure that we're able to do that. So as I, I said before, I'll be meeting with all of you one-on-one -on -one. And if you feel as though that you can sole source uh, an NSN, I definitely want that information. Full and open competition, as I'm restricted only, it can be awarded with, as Jill said, with a, a price evaluation preference. That price evaluation preference goes against the, the large business and not the small business. Some contracts, I think we can do more by way of allowing the asking basic, the prime to work with the subcontractor hub zone and see what we can do. Even though we don't get points for that, that's not calling it as, you know, a, a, a number toward our hub don't go, which I think it should be. And a few of my people in my office feel the same way, but it should be kind of toward the goal when you do subcontract with a small business, but it's not. But it still it helps the small business. And that's what it's all about in my eyes, making sure that you're able to get as much money as you can and do as much as you can for the work product and for your community. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, the China drill, huh? Eighty-five percent of all our solicitations are automated via the DLA Internet Bid Board system. Okay, but know that not all of them are awarded, as we discussed before. They're evaluated by a computer, but only eighty-five percent of them are awarded to the system. Sometimes they drop down and go to a buyer, and they must evaluate it manually. Make sure that. Okay, these procurements are system generators, web best evaluated by the computer, as I said before. And I want to say down here that the, and automated procurements have a T or U in the ninth position. So when you see that on the solicitation number, you know that is an automated procurement. And at the bottom here, the 15% of NSNs are actually purchased, purchased are one G items. That is not a number that I can feel really happy about. I can feel like, mm, look at us. No, we're trying to improve that because we need more than 15%. We're going to try to get that up as high as we possibly can. So we're working on that, okay? Next slide. Okay. Okay. We have detachments that are smaller all around the world. Um, and this one happens to be DLA Warren. And Carlo DeLeo is an awesome program manager there. He works with the U.S. Army Tank, uh, TACOM Armament Command, TACOM. I'm sure you heard of TACOM. And if you're interested in what they do there, you can do, they do repairable small spare parts as well. So you can contact them directly. And there's a spin over there on the side, on the right-hand side. Carlo is one real sharp, fast guy, and he'll take good care of you, believe me. So keep that in mind. Next slide. Okay, the DLA, uh, here's uh, some other uh, detachments, the DLA Aberdeen, which is with the Army, and DLA Mechanicsburg, which works with the Navy, okay? And this is Bradley, Bradley Hostapple. He is awesome as well. He's a shipyard organization. So if you want to work with them, they're there for you, okay? Next slide. I want to, you know, I got the permission before I show you this next slide because I, I wasn't sure if I could, but I thought it was good to see where we are. And this is all of our directors there. You see that there is um, Land Columbus, Warren, Aberdeen, Albany, 
Columbus, Maritime Columbus, Mechanicsburg, Puget Sound, Norfolk, Pearl Harbor, Portsmouth, and the LA Land and Maritime as a whole. You know how we how we're looking. So if you look at the bottom there, you'll see how we're doing with each one of them as it pertains to the Hub Zone program, the Hub Zone dollars. As you see that at the bottom, they have the 59.7 million. This year to date, the fifth year 21 year to date is 2.31. Our goal, of course, is three percent. Three month percentage average is 2.71. Now, this. This fluctuates a lot as it pertains to the husband program, okay? It may be two point something today, 2.31, uh, then it's 2.71, it just fluctuates away back and forth. But this is how we're doing now. This is, and as you notice, if you look across at the other ones, the service disabled veterans, that's my program as well, uh, the, the, uh, is the um, SBA, SBA. The 8A program, woman-owned program, and the economically women's-owned disadvantaged program, that they're all doing, they all are surpassing their goals by leaps and bounds. And why is that, you may ask? We have a lot more vendors, especially as it pertains to the women-owned and especially with the SCVSBs. We have a lot of 8As too as well. But the, the SCVSBs and the women-owned, there is a lot of them. So there's a lot of competition. They're bidding on everything. They're coming in. And the hub zones is not as many, and I understand why it's not as many because of the loopholes you got to jump through. You got to make sure you're in the hub zone business with 35% criteria, you know, residency criteria, and all that. Those have been hindrances, but somewhat hindrances, as you know, as I've been into the program. But they're they're needful, you know, to understand why they're in place. So this is the reason why we're not as you know, and that's why I'm doing this webinar today and invited PTAC as well as SBA to participate. We, I want to reach out to you. I want to reach out to you. I have a couple of strategies I plan to put in place that I would not discuss here. I would discuss one on one with those of you that are fit with me, and we'll see what we can do. We're going to make some miracles happen. So let's go to the next slide. As I am tired of the, that particular program that does so much for our warfighters as well as for our community, not to be making the soul, no excuses, and I give none. I put this in here only simply to say. In 2019, we, we won the award from the Hub Zone Council uh, for setting aside Hub Zones, had the most Hub Zones set aside in DOD. And I know it may be perplexing to you to say to yourself, well, how in the world could they win the award at the Department of Defense of uh, setting aside more Hub Zones and they still haven't met their goal? It wasn't about meeting the goal. It's about how many set aside that we set aside, which gives Hub Zone businesses more opportunities. And we did. Now, this was during the era in 2019 when I can do my own personal set aside. No longer is that the case. <laughs> now it goes to a different system where we're looking at you know, the land directorate and the maritime director. We must have approval from key supervisors, you know, their directors and key supervisors to set an innocent aside. So it's a little bit more timely, you know, time consuming. However, I understand, you know, because some things were set aside that maybe could not have, should not have been set aside. So now basically we do have a whole new set aside uh, process and it, it's going to work. So I, like I said before, I have a strategy for that. And I look forward to meeting with you guys one-on-one -on -one to discuss that, that's for sure. Okay. Maybe we'll win another award again. Let's go to seek assistance. Let's go to the next slide after that. Okay, Procurement Technical Assistance Program. This is our PTAC, and I think PTAC spoke for themselves. I tell you, I don't know what we would do without the PTAC and the SBA. I tell you, especially the PTAC. We would have so much work on us. We would have to hire so many more people. So the PTAC is there, and they get you ready for us, because a lot of times we have vendors come to us and don't have a clue what an NSN is, national stock number what an F FSC is, a federal stock class, they have no clue what that is. So when I hear these immediately, I immediately refer them to their local PTAC. And they'll learn the language, they'll learn their acronyms. And you know, you learn as you go. But it tells me then basically they're new, they're at the gate, they're ready to get out, but they're not ready for me. So I send them to our local PTAC and they polish them up and they come to me smiling, looking great, and we start to work with them. So I thank God for PTAC. Thank you, PTAC. Okay, next slide. What can I already talked about this somewhere, but what can the Office of Small Business Programs do for you? Okay, it's a sort of thing. Explain the government procurement terminology, procedures and regulations, 
or maybe we mainly think it's a repeat tag instead of doing that ourselves in most con in most situations. And identify points of contact. Uh, we are like we are facilitate communications with yourself and like people like Laurent La Alfonso that just spoke. It's not easy to reach those people. Now Alfonso was a nice guy, had to drag him to the table, but he came willingly <laughs> to, to speak with you. But it's not easy always to reach a contracting officer. So we help you do that, you know, and we also set up meetings. Like if you want to be, get a chance to do a virtual meeting before we had to be a small business counseling area where you could come into our facility, we sit around the round table and we talk about your system, let you do your, 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 your presentation on your business. And we listen and manage to the key people around the, around the table. I'd like our business uh, opportunity specialist, the people from the floor that you will need to work with who handles that particular end of things or those end of things or what you do, what you, what you are selling to sell have them around the table, but I can still do that. And we can do that by way of telephone or by, you know, virtually. It can still take place, so just keep that in mind. Okay, we assist you in identifying further supply classes for items and services your business provides. We act as an ombudsman for the small business, and I am definitely, that's the part I really love the best. I love to be the ombudsman for the small business. And we provide free training through seminars and webinars. Okay. Let's go to the next slide because I'm trying to make sure we don't keep it too long because I know we're over the one o'clock time and I'm so sorry. Okay, seminars and webinars. This is important here that, you know, this is what we do on a monthly basis. You can always look on our site and you can find webinars every month in these get it, this area, okay? And those areas and much more, not just that. Training opportunities knowledge, that's our TKO. As, uh, I think Jill or Chanda mentioned that. Um, did, did we still do that? Yes, we still do that. And I think they said that we do. Yes, we do. And that has grown tremendously. Before, we were doing it two days. When the pandemic hit, we went to one day. Uh, but now we're back at two days virtually. And we're receiving every, every time we do this, every month. And we do the monthly basis now. And that every time we do this, we have tons of small businesses coming in, not just hub zones. In fact, we have very few hub zones coming in here, so it can as not as many, of course, as SCGSB, the women own and 8A and all that. But this is an excellent, excellent, excellent training. We got an award for that, in fact. So TKO, training knowledge and opportunities. In fact, I tell you a little joke, and I know we don't have much time to joke, but when I first seen that TKO, but when I was a buyer, I thought that was a um, technical knockout. It wasn't that. Okay, next slide. Okay, that is. Okay, this is some basically just uh, DLA Office of Small Business Program contact information. Everything you need to know is right there. Take a look. Okay, let's go on to, let me say this. Things to remember, things I want you to remember. When you're doing a solicitation, before I wrap this up, when you do a solicitation, make sure you follow the solicitation to a T. If you have any questions, no questions, no question is a dumb question, okay? No question is a dumb question. For you to make a decision on an assumption, that's not smart. You don't want to do that. You look at that solicitation, and if you have questions on that and you're not sure about something, contact that buyer, that contracting officer. If you can't con contact that buyer, I can. That's a guarantee. And make sure you have that dialogue so that when you submit your, your quote, that you have a thorough understanding of that solicitation and you go forth. And another thing I want you to remember is this, when you quote, and especially regardless if it's a set aside for a hub zone, I see this a lot. Some people have a tendency of inflating their price because they assume being that it's a set aside that we must award to a hub zone, not the case. There's been a lot of, I found out a lot of awards lost by the Hub Zone program because a buyer may call them outlandish folks. And I've ended up talking to them after it's over and it's too late and it's awarded to someone else. I don't want to see a, a Hub Zone set aside awarded to anyone else besides a Hub Zone set aside. So make sure you do your due diligence, quote, fair, and reasonable. Okay? Make sure on your SBA profile that you put everything in there you need for us to see. You are selling yourself to us. We want to buy, we want to buy, we need to buy from you, hopefully. So you must give us all the information we need promoting your business on your SBA profile. 
And rarely, when I first started, this was a problem. I don't see it as much now. Just every now and then, I'll get an email for it from a um, from a vendor, from a buyer. I say, "Hey, Donna, I can't reach this company." And maybe your phone has went out, and you may not know it. Make sure, from time to time, you check to make sure everything is working appropriately. Make sure your emails is working appropriately. I had things come back to me, information come back. The buyers had things come back, and they're trying to give you an award. Because most likely, if they call you, then they're you you're close to getting an award. And you know, so maybe there's a negotiation, or maybe they have another question to ask you, and they need to reach you. Not all buyers will contact me, but now it's kind of mandated. Before they go around a hub zone, or they, or they just disregard a hub zone, they must contact me. Okay, so that, that's a wonderful thing that land and maritime directors put in place. I asked them, would they please have the buyers contact me before going around a hub zone for whatever reason. So they are doing that, I'm glad of that. Something else I want to make sure that you remember, very important, that when you start working with us and you're already working with us, Check your spur score. Make sure you know how well you're doing or how not so well you're doing. And then we'll be given this opportunity to help you clean that up. Okay? Now, most importantly, also remember this. These are just some notes that just came from my head. Remember, working with us is a marathon. It is not a sprint. I've had small businesses that come in and before you know it, boom, as soon as they started, they got an award within a month. That's, that's awesome. It happens. It can happen. But in most cases, sometimes it takes some vendors up to a year to get an award. That's okay. You know, and then sometimes they'll call me a lot often. They'll call me and say, hey, what am I doing wrong? And then we'll sit down and we have a meeting virtually now and talk about how they're quoting how does their capabilities look? I mean, you know, the scores, all that. We'll discuss how they're faring. And then some of them I kind of babysit. And when they put in for quotes, when they put in a bid, they'll let me know about it. And if this is a business that I think can do the job, and if it's a business I think, you know, that needs a chance, they're new. And I know someone asked a question before about new, how you view new businesses. It's very important that a new business is given an opportunity. How else can they do well and how else can they work with us if they're not given an opportunity? I promote opportunity. Okay? Well, so those remember those things. It's very, very important. Next down here, let's look at my next slide. And I just like this slide because it's just pretty. And that's the one with the green. Come on. Sound is still there? She's there. Yes, I'm here. Did you? The next slide, yes. please, ma'am. Oh, I'll snap Megas. Next slide. There it is. Shine it always come through. Okay, this is my fresh start. As I said before, I have a strategy I'm putting in place. Okay. And as I will meet with you one on one, we'll talk about that strategy. This is a new beginning, a fresh start, and we're starting off this finish line together. And we're going to make this goal because it's not an impossible task at all. The lowest as it, as it was, our goal. I mean, the percentage was 0.67%, 0.67% when I started as a HubZone program manager. The highest it was was 2.84%. Now, you know, when that happened, I was so excited. I was so very excited. Like, we're almost there, we're almost there. Then all of a sudden, it changes. And then you had 2.31%. So I'm saying that if we get more, we get more HubZone business to come in that are qualified to do the innocence who quote, and that's been a problem. That's been a problem also. Sometimes there's a set aside out, out there and nobody quotes. Before they would go around us and we would lose the award. Now, they, again, they must come to me and say, hey, Donna, can you help me find some hub zones that can work this innocence? So that's new for, that's new for DLA, for us to do that, DLA and Maritime. So we're doing that and that's working much better. Next one. The next, next slide, I think that's the last one, is we can do this. It's not a question in my mind. It can be done. And I look forward to implementing that new strategy with the ones that can work with us. And again, as I say to you, even if you don't see a fit for your agency with DLA Dana, Man, Man, Maritime, I will direct you to one of our sister agencies that can work with you. 
So with that, I didn't mean to rush so fast, but I was looking at time, and I, we just had 1 o'clock, and I do apologize that it took a little longer than that, but we had some really good questions, and that was good to be answered. I am still ready to ask, answer questions if you want me to. I don't have a problem. I will say I'm not in a rush for that, but I just want to make sure I consider your time and the PTAC and FDA time. So with that, I am done. Let me thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Lots of great information, wonderful information. I know we ran over a little bit. Um, we don't apologize because I think it was an excellent presentation, a lot of engagement, a lot of great questions. I think that is yeah. what um, kind of uh, put us behind time was the questions. And so I don't think for that yeah. reason is that people were engaged and they want to know. Um, so there is a question and I know you had a slide early on, but somebody wanted to know what kinds of products and services are is DLA most interested in? Um, okay, let me see. Most, most interested. So I think it was the uh, earlier slide that had the different, like land and maritime, troop support, um, energy, and it lists the type okay. of products and services. So it's like at the beginning. Okay, look, as I'm looking here, I have something else pulled up that they can't see. Um, next, there it next is. Of 3, you see it? Where is it? Okay, yes, yes, that's what we're looking for. We all, yeah, this is definitely, oops, my, my notepad just went crazy. Okay, yeah, so you see there the wheel vehicles and all that. So, you know, I have other things like the motor vehicle transmissions, powertrain parts, um, motor vehicle electronic, electronic equipment manufacturing, current carrying wiring device manufacturing, motor vehicle seatings, interior trim, oh, radio, television, broadcasting, wireless communications. It's just tons of it. I can go on and on and on. And when I have that one-on-one -on -one with you, if you know if you're fit for me, or if you're not, I can answer that more, give you more, more, more information. In fact, I have a spreadsheet that I'm going to put together for uh, the ones that are fit for me and for the agency, and to show them the hot new items that's coming out. You know that we want the hub zone to really focus on if they can. Okay, wonderful. And let's see if I don't know if Jill is still there. I'm trying to see if I can get the. TKO at DLA. Um, they still I'm have here. those. Is there going to be? I, I have it. I just okay. put it up uh, and I can post it in the chat. Donna, do you know if they're going to do the next TKO? Do you know when the oh, next yeah. TKO? Okay, will I don't be? have that right in front of me, but it's, all you do is look at that link. I put a link down there for the TKO. There's a link there in your, in your, in your PowerPoint. Let me find it. It looks like there will be one in uh, August 17th. Uh, here's the link, August 17th, September. Uh, let me see if I can post the link in here. I just looked it up. So those um, Donna mentioned the doing business with, so if you wanna get more information, they'll even go into more depth and have more people to present doing business with DLA. Yes, Shonda, we'll have the uh, subject matter experts doing each one of those topics. Uh, so they're called TKO trainings. I like Donna said she thought that That's that right. was. Uh... Yeah, TKO knowledge and opportunities. I thought it was technical knockout because I like the box. A technical <laughs> knockout. There it is. So you thought Donna just kind of skimmed the surface today. So as she said, there'll be more um uh, uh su subject matter experts that will even go more into depth and it's basically almost yeah. a full day is it still two days of uh is now back is, to, is now back to two days okay so two days of training and it's still webinars how to do business with yeah. dla they'll go over the nuts and bolts everything in depth and you can visit the uh the link to find out the next um, trainings. I think, believe there's one in um, August 17th. There's some in September, some in October and uh, November and December. Um, right. One other question, Don, I think, because um, I know people were hitting up against 130, but about the 3% hub zone requirement, how does that flow down to government contractors? Uh, for instance, they, they're shipbuilders and they sell to NAVC. And they want to know about that 3% hub zone goal. So if you wanted to chime in, I, I can also add something to that. 
Well, go ahead. Then I'll go ahead. No, you 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 go ahead because you're the. No, okay. Are we are we talking about the uh, the, uh, the 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 shipyards? They all have the same goal. Um, I think it must be. I think exactly. they're refer referencing the as far as when Jill uh, gave the um, she had a slide about uh, with all federal agencies, it's required that uh, federal agencies should be doing 23% of its business with small businesses. And out of that 3%, they should be doing it with hub zone certified businesses. Now, small businesses they don't have to do anything. It's just that the agencies, that's the goal. And at the end, what Donna was talking about, that 3% and the agency almost met that, um, that is the goal of the agency. Yeah. So they are definitely looking for, you know, small businesses that are hub zone certified and the other socioeconomic certifications. But you as a small business don't have to do anything to add to that other than, no. you know, if you are certified, make sure that you are you have it on your capability statement, you know, you're marketing yourself, you're keeping your certifications up to date, um, making sure that your SBA profile is up to date, but you don't have to do anything as a small business. That's up to the agency to do that. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, exactly. And that's a mandate from Congress. And, you know, that is a mandate from Congress. So we must, you know, that's why we're on this so hard. You know, we've got to get this, got to get it up. That's what said it's a good time for you to be a hub zone. It really is with the LA Land America. And I think we'll take this as a last question. Do the shipbuilders build dynamics have to follow the same goal? Okay, my phone so, just went out. Can you say that again, Sandra? The shipbuilders, like general dynamics they have, do they have to follow the same goal? They are supposed to, yes, they have a percentage that they must designate to. That's why I said about subcontracting. That's one of the ones we're going to be talking right. to. Yes, they they must work with the small businesses as well as subcontractors. Correct. Yes, and they must. And that is an area where I am most curious because I find sometimes a lot of them say we can't find a hub zone. We can't find a hub zone. I said, well, then you need my assistance because we need to find you some hub zones and make sure that they're able to get you know get themselves funded, and you can make you make that goal because they're not making their goal, and they're not make, they're not meeting their goal in hub zones. Yes, and um, as Donna said, those large prime contractors, the large companies that are doing business right. with the government, um, when they have a certain dollar amount of a contract, then they are required to have a subcontracting plan where they have to involve small businesses and in some instances use the socioeconomic categories. But again, your P tax would be the best um, resource to follow up with as well as Donna the small business office at DLA. Um, and if you have something that's real specific, I definitely, Julian would refer you to your PTAX and refer you to Donna and the small business office at DLA, it's 1.30. So again, we definitely wanna thank Donna so much for her time today, providing the knowledge and not just the knowledge, but the passion. You can hear the passion that she has and Alonzo oh, yeah. has oh, yeah. um, in presenting and what they do and working with small businesses and wanting to see you do not only be successful and not only for you to do business with DLA, but the federal government for you to be a um, successful small business federal government contractor. So with that, again, thank you for your time. We did go over. I don't wanna apologize in that it was a great interactive session. Everyone had some great questions, a lot of information. So if you're new to this, welcome to doing the business with the federal government. There's a lot of, <laughs> uh, lot of information. There's a lot of details that are involved that you have to know. So again, please work with your PTAX, reach out to DLA, reach out to Donna, reach out to Alonzo and attend the TKOs. Um, this is the first segment of um, our manufacturing uh, training that we're doing for this month. We will have another session. Let me look at my notes um, on what day. Uh, let me look back at my notes real quick. We're going to do a panel discussion. We'll talk about the non-manufacturing rule on August 19th. We'll have an attorney from headquarters to present on that. And then on the 31st, we'll have a panel of small business 
manufacturers. So you do don't want to miss. We have a three-part training series that we're focusing on manufacturing. So August 19th, non-manufacturer rule, August 31st, um, a panel discussion with small uh, manufacturing businesses. Um, today's link will be posted on the PTAC site um, next week so you can reference it. Again, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day. Please join us on the 19th and on the 31st and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you again, Donna and Jill and Alonzo and Bill. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Thank you and thank you everybody yeah, thank that's you, stayed on. It <laughs> and Sharon and Bill. <laughs> thank you guys. It wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't happen without you. <laughs> this was a great session today. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Sharon Smith, thank you. Didn't know Sharon was on.